Beginning in Australian cinemas on the 9th of May is Goran Stalewski's latest film, Housekeeping for Beginners. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the writer-director of Housekeeping for Beginners, Goran Stalewski. Goran, welcome again to Movie Metropolis. Thank you, Peter. Always a pleasure for me too. Great to talk to you. And I, I remember last time we spoke uh, about your film Of an Age, at the end of the interview, you mentioned that you were preparing a new film called Housekeeping for Beginners. <laughs> so. <laughs> Here's what we prepared earlier. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly right. Exactly. So tell me about the the way you constructed this uh, story of this Erzatz family. I, I found it so fascinating. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, um, it sort of, it took a long time to come together, I guess. The first time I got the idea was, I think, over 10 years ago now, um, when a friend of mine posted a photo uh, online of from his youth in Melbourne and living in like a bustling queer household when he first moved here in the late 70s. And I thought, you know, that would be a nice space to live in for a story. Uh, I updated it to present day uh, Macedonia, where I grew up. Um, and went from there. I sort of had it at the back of my head for a few years and then um, sat down to write down the screenplay during one of my many uh, multi-year bouts of unemployment <laughs> as a filmmaker. Uh, I wrote it about uh, 2016, I think, 2015-16, and then um, at some point the career took off, uh, so I finally got to make it <laughs> last year, uh, which was great. And yeah, it played in the U.S. Uh, last month. It's playing here in cinemas uh, starting the night. Yes. I, I was so intrigued in the way that you constructed this queer story, which um, had such carefully crafted characters and nuanced sort of dramatic elements to it. Uh, as you were saying, it must have taken you quite a while to uh, to fashion all of that into a credible screenplay. Mm. Yeah, I sort of, um, the way I often work is uh, once I have the idea, I often don't really sit to write it down straight away. I kind of let it sort of live and percolate at the back of my head for many years and sort of, you know, feelings and characters and energies sort of accumulate. And it's only when I have like what I feel like is enough for a web of relationships, you know, uh, or stories sort of formed at the center that I um, sit down and write it. Um, and that's kind of what happened in this case. I sort of had a few, a few ideas for scenes. Um, and um, I sort of like, I'm very character based in everything, really. Um, even when I have, you know, a big, high, complicated concept, um, uh, it's not about the plot in my head until I have the characters figured out. Because I think, you know, story and plot are extremely important. Mm. But, um, you don't really care unless the detail and the personalities make you care, you know, in the first place. So uh, it was only once I had the feelings and the personalities um, and their dynamics, you know, sort of worked out emotionally for myself uh, before I sat down and uh, plotted it all out. Ah, well, well done on that, because uh, I was quite intrigued into the dramatics uh, and the interchanges between the various characters, the tragedy that happens, the the creation of a family that is fraught with uh, a whole range of issues. And uh, uh, I was so intrigued as to how that could have gone. It could have gone quite uh, pear-shaped. It could have gone... Um, very positively. I mean, there's a number of different directions that you could go with it. Yeah, I think um, in my, you know, part of the world where I grew up, often the instinct is to go towards like bleak misery. <laughs> <laughs> in all storytelling, much less anything that tackles, you know, a topical issue. Um, and that's kind of my least favorite place to be in, you know, the bleak misery, uh, Eastern European sensibility. So I kind of, um, it wasn't, you know, a conscious sort of uh, um, intellectual reason to to go for, you know, uh, look for the joy and the color more than anything else. It's sort of, uh, I think for all of us, when you're kind of writing and directing from, you know, a place of uh, where you feel connected to it, you're looking for the scenes and the moments and the feelings that get you excited, that would get you ex excited as a viewer, you know, um, and I think especially in this case, you know, I think whether or not um, you're familiar with 
the intricate sociopolitics <laughs> of queers in the Balkans. I, I don't think that's necessary, but you can kind of assume it's a bit grim. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that, I don't think you need me here to be hectoring you about it to let you know that it's grim. So I kind of, you know, assume that the viewer understands that and we don't have to dwell on the grimness. We kind of can focus on these particular people, not as a general abstract sense, but um, in their specifics. You know, so it becomes a story about kind of uh, family and the choices you make and the choices life forces you to make and how you're still kind of trying to live your best life um, and trying to find moments of fun and, you know, karaoke. <laughs> <That's the case laughs> <maybe>. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Yes, as you're saying, the Balkans, Macedonia, where you shot the film, etc. The the issue of being queer is obviously still um, fraught with issues and problems, and there are also cultural aspects. Um, noting the different um, sort of castes or or uh, backgrounds of people, gypsies, for example, uh, and so on. Uh, it's it's not necessarily a very pleasant environment to live in. It's complicated everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, you know, in uh, in places, I, I always kind of uh, worry about these things becoming, you know, about cultural differences. And I feel like everywhere in the world, we sort of seem to be unaware of how the socioeconomics help culture, you know, <laughs> like a shape culture. Like, I think if in employment uh, and other things were set up in this country, like you wouldn't be worried as much. Uh, it wouldn't be as hard for minorities as it is. I think in a lot of places, you know, like in, in with Ukrainian refugees right now, like the Roma people coming out of Ukraine are struggling to find housing uh, way more than the majority. Um, so I think as, as soon as there's many problems, uh, kind of minorities of whichever kind they are tend to be thrown away first and tend to suffer the most and more overtly. Um, and yeah, uh, Macedonia is no different in terms of following those patterns. Um, it's like there's a lot of poverty. So, um, of course, uh, the minorities and the people outside of, you know, on the, on the fringes end up kind of experiencing the brunt of it. Yes, exactly. And, and, and in this creation of this ersatz or created family, I was reminded, this may surprise you, I was reminded of the Japanese film Shoplifters because that's also uh, about a creation of a, a group or family um, that has to try and cope and live together with their circumstances. And I, I, I was wondering if that at all was uh, any inspiration. Well, Shoplifters came out in 2019, and I wrote this film in 2015. Ah. <laughs> I read it earlier, so no, I wouldn't say that. But it is, I think, one of the greatest films ever made. Um, I think it's the last time I like cried so profusely. I made a fool of myself in the cinema. Like Shoplifters, like broke me. I adore that film. I um and that filmmaker. Um, you know, I really, you know, I can't pretend it's inspiration, obviously, because mm. of it. <laughs> uh what i said but i think you know i think it's a beautiful reference point um in that sense and and it's funny you know like i don't really um i think most artists sort of get slotted into patterns and influences uh, in a way that um everyone kind of looks at your work to see what it's similar to before mm -hmm. they actually look at you for who you are especially if you're like a new voice or a new filmmaker um and sometimes you know that can be a little bit counterproductive but sometimes you kind of learn from other people who your influences were because i think you know, art kind of shapes your brain in a way that's very instinctive and unconscious. Um, and I think uh, the things that influence me sometimes aren't even clear to myself. You know, it's not an intellectual process. Uh, and I think uh, viewers can sometimes tell uh, much better than I myself can, you know. Uh, so it's a fairly, I think, valid um, way of looking at it um, in that sense. But yeah, uh, it's a film I love, but I wouldn't say it was a new one. <laughs> no, no, that's fair enough. I didn't realize that uh, you'd written a, the screenplay so much in advance of uh, uh, of Shoplifter. So anyway, that's perfectly fine. And uh, and you certainly have a distinctive voice, and, and that's uh, so important yeah. in uh, in the three major films that you've made so far. Can I ask you about housekeeping for beginners, the casting? Because you have such a, an incredible array of actors in your film. How did you find them all? Mm. Yeah, it was a two-pronged process uh, because half of the cast is uh, Roma people um, and then 
there are almost no trained actors of, of Roma background, not just in Macedonia, across Europe, actually, is what we found. Um, and uh, the ones we could find were in the film. <laughs> we're very grateful for it. Uh, but, you know, for a lot of the film, necessarily, we have to do street casting and kind of looking for uh, non-trained uh, uh, people to work in the film. Um, so I had two casting agents. One was Katerina uh, Grubach, who casts um, pretty much every time I work in Macedonia. She's who does the casting for me. And she was in charge of all, all the Roma uh, half of things. So she spent uh, every single day for three months, as in seven days a week, uh, in the suburb of Shutka, where, you know, a key part of the film takes place. Uh, meeting people um there's you know one of the key roles is a five-year-old girl i think katarina met with 2000 <laughs> uh little girls um that's just for that one character um and it was really just photographing people and asking them if they would be open to being in a movie um and then i kind of cast based on photos a little bit um and then I had a separate uh, casting agent, Milka Anshevska, who did uh, the other half, the cast, essentially, apart from the two leads who are friends. Um, well, Anna Maria, who plays the lead, is a friend of mine because we've already made a film together uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and Vladimir uh, Tintor is a uh, Serbian actor. Uh, who, he plays Tony. Um, he, um, I, I'd seen his work um, in other films. And um, yeah. I've been trying to work with him for years and finally we had a chance. Well, they all work so well together. I was wondering how long it took to shoot the film and and how easy it was for them all to, to work so cohesively. Mm. Um, putting it together was extremely complicated and stressful. Um, you know, I aged 12 years in that process. <laughs> um, but once we started shooting, it was just... Like, um, it was an amazing experience. Um, there were, you know, it was challenging in the sense that, again, one of the main actors is a five-year-old. And, you know, she wasn't cast for her willingness to follow instructions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was cast because she's great on screen and she has fire in her eyes, but she's not an easy <laughs> to handle by any means. So there were, you know, curveballs every single day. But um, <laughs> it was, like, lots of fun in terms of, like, the rest of the cast and crew uh, the way we all functioned, it was very much like a family vibe, uh, you know, with, uh, you, you know, we'd shoot all day and then hang out afterwards, <laughs> you know, even on weekends. Um, it only took about four weeks to ah. film it all. Um, and we finished the day early, uh, partly because we had to, you know, speed things up because if little five-year-old Jada was in the mood to shoot, we had to shoot everything very quickly, <laughs> which in the end turned out to be very efficient. We finished two days early and we had a two-day wrap party, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Um, so yeah, and a lot of beautiful memories. <laughs> well, well done on that. I mean, it it just w works and flows so well. I was interested too that, uh, and you tend to do this using handheld camera, uh, but also, I think was the film shot in as uh, in uh, Academy ratio. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, which you know now it's extremely fashionable. So like you know every video clip and A twenty four production is uh, in that ratio because I think people just have decided it's temporarily cool. But the reason <laughs> I'm drawn to it is because I grew up on forties uh, Hollywood before <laughs> white screen was invented, um, and it's sort of um, it's not about a homage or like you know technical coolness or anything. It's about um, those films, when they were shot, like, uh, and often in quite strong close-ups, um, because of the nature of the framing, like, a face could take up most of the screen, and it leads to, like, uh, unconsciously to a much uh, more intense uh, connection between the viewer and the character. Um, so that's why, I'm, like, all three of my films are kind of shot in either that kind of frame or something very close to it. Uh, for for the way uh, that works, you know, in the chest of the viewer who's experiencing, you know, uh, the film. Um, and uh, that'll, uh, with my next film, I think that'll actually change a little bit, uh, partly because I, every film comes from an energy that you're trying to capture, a feeling, you know, um, and you, I kind of start from that feeling and sort of go, what leads to... Uh, the audience experiencing it and in this case like the tighter frame I, th I thought would help it and also make it make you feel what it would feel like to be in you know Macedonia in 
uh, this year um, living in this hectic household. Uh, but sometimes, you know, a little bit more distance is needed uh, to achieve a certain, a certain other kind of feeling. So, you know, uh, I, I go, I feeling kind of shapes everything for me. I understand that. I mean, that demonstrates the work of a, a real auteur, someone, and you have real control over your films the as you write and direct them. And you also edited this one as well, which I think you've done previously mm. too. Mm. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm lucky that I work with people who let me do that. <laughs> let me get away with it. Um, I, I do, you know, that's the other thing, like, um, especially um, uh, th things that I've taken for granted, to be honest, um, that I now meeting other filmmakers who are sort of at my level um, in terms of, uh, you know, just starting out with features. Uh, who, you know, haven't necessarily had the most pleasant experiences on set. Uh, so I, I really have learned to appreciate that I work with um, these amazing people. Like, in this case, the main producer was Maria Dimitrova in Macedonia, who, like, is a fierce fighter in the sense that, like, you know, like a mother tigress in terms of protecting the film. But she does it in a way that, like, you know, I don't even know about uh like how much she's doing you know behind the scenes like protecting her child essentially um and all the crew has a beautiful experience on set while she's doing all these things uh behind the scenes to make sure we all do you know to make it as easy for us as possible and then you know to trust us that we're going to do the best job possible as well um and on my other films, I've worked with Christina Seaton um, and Sam Jennings from Causeway Films in Australia. And they're kind of very much the same. Um, they really, you know, they're not there to, they're, they're there to make sure the film is going to be as good as possible, but they're not there to force you to do things. Um, they also really, you know, appreciate you as a human being, first and foremost, before you get to be an artist. Um, and I'm so lucky to be working with people who have that kind of, you know, understanding. And it it, it inspires you as a director then to, like, also uh, be protective of people, um, other people on set, and make sure that they're also looked after and, you know, they feel kind of um, seen and heard, you know. Yes, exactly. That, that that relationship is so important, and and you and housekeeping for beginners has already received a, a fair bit of recognition, including the Queer Lion Award at Venice, which is terrific. And also, it was the North Macedonian entry for the International Oscars. So, that's real kudos to you. Yeah, I mean, you know, every little thing like that, you know, that kind of leads to more people hearing about the film or watching it is wonderful. Um, I'm not a very awards-driven person. <laughs> I used to be, you know, when I was little, I used to watch the Oscars obsessively. Um, and, you know, there's a little nostalgic element associated with it. But um, I kind of think um, the quality, quality and awards are not always lined up <laughs> a lot of time i've won awards i did not deserve and i've lost awards i did deserve <laughs> if I may say so. so i kind of find it all a little bit arbitrary uh you know it's where you can get it but you know if you don't it's no longer you know something that uh really haunts me by any means um but yeah for sure i mean the queer line meant more people got to hear about the film mm. um and especially queer audiences got to hear about the film because you know I, I mean this film is made for everyone it's very accessible but like I think, you know, there's a special resonance for, for a gay person, especially if they don't happen to live, you know, in a Western developed economy that can know about the film and kind of like connect to it and sort of like, uh, you know, uh, feel some feelings that maybe have pent up <laughs> while watching it, which is great. Um, and same, you know, with the Oscars conversation, like we didn't, you know, even end up shortlisted. Uh, but along the way, more people got to see it. Let's talk about the film. Um, and every little bit helps, you know, in the end. So, yeah. It does. It does. So well done on all that. Okay, just to conclude, uh, Goran, I always love asking you this, and you sort of hinted at this. What's the, your next film? Mm, well, <laughs> uh, I rarely know, to be honest, um, because <laughs> it's about who ends up giving me money to do what. <laughs> point. Um, I throw projects at people and then they get to pick one. <laughs> um although actually um yeah it, it's a complicated thing I, I kind of can't answer it too well I'm, I'm working on two films intensively at the moment one is kind of more advanced than the other um but like you never know it, it um there's this kind of illusion that the director is in charge of things and it's like no they're not like the people with the money are in charge of things uh, famous actors are the most in charge of things <laughs> they have to agree to things first they're like 
I have ideas that I throw pe at people, um, and then if one of them lands, wonderful. You know, I I'd love to be talking to you again next year uh, with a new movie. Um, but let's see, let's see how that goes before I talk about it too much right now. I understand, and hopefully that will all work out. But uh, at the meantime, congratulations on Housekeeping for Beginners. We've been speaking to the writer-director of that film in cinemas in Australia from the 9th of May. And Goran, as always, a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Leave it more so for me. Thanks so much, Peter. Okay. All the best. Bye-bye. You too. All the best. Bye. Bye.